again, Ian, thanks so much for taking the time to chat. Do you want to quickly introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, so uh, my name is Ian Spriggs. Most people know me as a digital portrait artist. Uh, I've done a couple of portraits, which are kind of hyper-realistic. So a lot of people can confuse them to be photographs and all that. And mm -hmm. so I've kind of become more well-known in the industry through doing photorealistic digital humans. Uh, but I do work full time as in, at Unity right now, mm -hmm. doing digital humans. I've got maybe 16 years working in the visual effects industry before that. Uh, I worked at places like ILM, Mr. X. I worked everywhere. On, image engine. Yeah, but, I can yeah, your resume. Engine, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I had a background in art art school too. But that was back in the day. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, like I'm, I'm super psyched and I was curious, like this is something I ask pretty much everyone these days when they come on the podcast, because, you know, it, it's always a different answer. Like I was a lawyer and then I decided I'm going to pursue my passion that I always wanted, but my parents told me oh, it's not a real career or whatever it might be. Did you always think growing up that you wanted to be an artist or was it something that you fell into kind of later on? I've always, I was always an artist. Like I always loved doing art and I always focused on that but having it as a career was I didn't even know it was possible I remember back in the day it was like when like our parents generation is like being an artist is like oh that's a nice hobby but <laughs> what do you want to do for work <laughs> that's right exactly it's like what do you want to do for your career of uh, you know, yeah. your spare time when I discovered like the visual effects industry it was just like it was like an eye-opener like I just realized it's like oh this actually can be a possibility I was like 26 years old before I realized having a career in arts is possible. That's so cool. Um, I'm curious, like for you, like what was that? What was like kind of the catalyst? Like where where was that big, you know, realization for you? Was it seeing a certain film or just the fact that you're you're like, hey, the, there's actually money in this thing, you know, it, it, it's something I can actually leverage. Like I'm just kind of curious for you, like where you first discovered it. So after art school, I couldn't get a job. So I was uh, I was living in Montreal, just unemployed, just drawing. And then my younger brother ended up going to Sheridan in Toronto for animation school. And then he was like, hey, Ian, like uh, Seneca, another animation school's applying, like uh, still accepting for uh, positions for like the schooling. So it's like, you said, you should apply. I'm like, what are you like? What are you talking about? And then he kind of introduced me to like this world of this like I didn't even know before. And I was like, oh my lord, I can actually go to the school and get a job in visual effects afterwards. And I, it's like seeing that pathway. Like as soon as I could see the pathway, I knew that's the what I was going to be doing. It was just becoming aware of what that path was. Is the hard part. I'm curious too, just to kind of jump ahead a little bit. But like, uh, what was your first job in 3D? Like, how did you first get in? I did stalk you a little bit and I noticed you were doing some stereoscopic stuff at the very beginning, but um, <laughs> yeah, I'm just curious, like, uh, what was the first kind of big job that you landed? Did you ever see uh, Veggie Tales? The, I uh, don't think I did. But... It's um, like little, like uh, fruits, like uh, tomatoes and faces. And, like... I, I feel like the title just already <laughs> kind of gives me the whole vision of like what it is, like ca 3D cartoon characters <laughs> yeah. doing stuff. Yeah, so, so I worked on a, a film for the Veggie Tales. Mm -hmm. I actually went to the theater to watch it because it was my first feature film. And there was like me plus like a, like a mom with a five-year-old and that was it. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool though. Yeah, I'm curious too, like for you at the time, like what was that like getting to see your, your work on the big screen, even if it was VeggieTales? Yeah, I, I absolutely loved it. It was pretty cool seeing my name on like on the credits. Mm -hmm. The first time for me, but that was pretty exciting. It was kind of like I realized, yeah, it's like this is a cool career. I'm going to really enjoy doing this. Yeah, no, that's great. I think it is really fascinating the fact that, I mean, you're doing this organically anyway, but like getting to uh, create work with a collaborative team of people and then the fact that like all these people get to see it on the big screen and get to experience it around the world. And like I said, you're also doing this organically with your work. The fact that, mm -hmm. um, again, you brought this up, uh, the, the fact that people kind of get confused about like, oh yeah, like that's a cool photograph not re realizing potentially the amount of painstaking work that goes into it and talent. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I think as being in the industry for as long as I am, have been now, I'm realizing like how much, it's almost like you have to learn a language. Like if mm -hmm. you want to speak a new language, it's going to take you a couple of years to know it. And like learning Maya, learning Mudbox ZBrush, all these crazy tools, it's like you really have to dive into it and then having to explain that to somebody looking from the outside in is like, it's very hard to 
grasp how much knowledge you can get, get over the years. I think he had a, a thing in uh, 99, which was, um, you know, there's jobs and there's careers. And, you know, I think 3D is definitely one of those things. It's it's a massive career. It's something that um, you don't just dabble in. It's like you, you're really going to need to put in your time for a long time before you really get to, you know, see the results in a way that you can feel comfortable and confident about what you're doing. Well, there's so many hurdles along the way. It's like yeah. most stuff, like most companies, you will have to work a crazy amount of overtime. If you have a family, it's very difficult to have like split that time. It's highly competitive. Mm -hmm. So it's like, if you're not like the best in the in, in your field, you, somebody else is just going to take your job. And it's like, and then uh, most contracts are just shorts. Like if you, usually most people go from one company to another, just kind of following the work. Not often you can actually land a job where you stay in one spot. So. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of curious what your take is. I mean, obviously right now you're working at Unity, but like, and obviously you, you're pretty much one of those household names, in my opinion. I don't, didn't mean to come in uh, kissing your butt, but I mean, what are your thoughts now in the industry? Because I, I do feel like I'm actually trying to hire so many people right now and it's, it's so hard to actually find people available. So in a way, like I'm really excited about that, knowing what you just said that like how much, uh, you know, difficulty there is to stand out, to get the attention, to um, be able to get work over all these other people who are all competing for your work or for, for your job. I'm kind of curious, like what your thoughts are on the state of the industry these days, given the fact that TV has real budgets now, feature films are just being pumped out like a machine more than ever, uh, video games, you know, there's all these additional realms like VR and AR, um, you know, all these different things that are starting to pop up that if anything now we've we've got more opportunity for work than ever before. So do you feel now it's it's a little bit flipped on on the other end where there's more work uh, and opportunities than ever before? Uh, yeah, I'd say so. It's kind of like, it's, it's a big question because it's like so many different yeah, aspects of our industry now. Like like 15 years ago, you go into a 3D and it's like, oh, I'd be, be a model. That's my job title, like I model everything. Now those job titles have split into like subcategories of subcategories. And so like, yeah, like specific. And it's like, there's a lot more jobs for each role, but. Fantasy uh, organic creature artist. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's so, so many very specific genres and yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, but I definitely think it's, uh, the industry is getting bigger and I think it's more jobs are becoming available. And it's, I, I really do think it's the future. Like everything's mm -hmm. going to be digitalized at some point. This is the way we're heading and our industry is the one, one which is going to help make it, make it that happen. So I think it is a kind of exciting time to get into the industry. Like yeah. I can't see myself ever doing anything else. I think it's just too exciting not to be doing this. Cause they're like, we were like creating cutting edge tools and yeah, we're creating like the future basically. Yeah. That's the exciting thing is I think back to, I think it was 92 that I started dabbling in 3d and, and 2d art and um, you know, when 95 kicked around, I was so excited because I could finally point at Toy Story and be like, that's the kind of stuff that, you know, <laughs> I do. And um, just just in terms of no one knew what VFX was or, you know, 3D animation, any of these things. And, you know, whereas now, like, I kind of jealous the fact that people are learning 3D in high school and um, the fact that software is free, there's, yeah, that, you know, studios have mentorship pro programs and, uh, you know, internships, all these different things to support people getting in. So it's definitely changed. It's definitely a more lucrative or I should say more supported industry than it was when it's people hiding in their basement in the dark on, on the internet doing 3D and, and sharing it with each other. Yeah, I remember uh, when I first started 3D, I had a couple of questions which the teachers wouldn't know. So I had to go to the textbook and like <laughs> open up the page and read it because there's nothing online. There's no forums that helps with like support at that time. Some there's some forums on CG Talk, but yeah, it's like to actually find out some information is almost impossible. Now it's like, yeah, students uh, like yeah. being exposed to so much information right away. It, it's kind of funny. It's, it's definitely flipped where now it's about finding the right information versus finding information. Before it was like any information. Now it's like, okay, like you know, <laughs> what are the resources I want to trust versus like yeah, there just being so much you got to sift through. I'm kind of curious for you, like what were back then the websites that you were visiting and hanging out on, like forums, communities, stuff like that? Uh, I think CG Talk was my number one. Yeah. Yeah, I think I went to that just for everything. Just like those are good forums, good art galleries. Yeah. I remember that was my goal, like, because they, they were very like elite, like to get onto the onto the front page, 
Was it just like mm-hmm. only the top of the best gonna get, get on there? Yeah, whenever you got, um, uh, I've forgotten the, the term for it, but yeah, basically shown on the front page, I was like a big, a big deal. It's just, um, which is really cool. And I remember CG Channel, especially oh, back yeah. like, uh, I think like 2000, 2001, whenever you, you get some news posted on their thing, they'd always email you like, prepare for your website to crash in it and it would because of, you know back then there's be so much traffic would hit your thing because they just anything hosted on there would just you know flood the servers so it's kind of interesting back then is to kind of like look at how different things were and obviously now there is so much stuff out there it's i think you kind of get a little desensitized to it at times yeah i yeah i agree like there's just piles of piles of artwork and it's kind of like it's, even though some of the good stuff gets kind of lost that's also the the crazy thing too is when um, there there is so much talent that like you know you go back to early 3D you know it, the amount of work it would take to do some subpar stuff and now it's like some little kid with Max or Maya or ZBrush is doing immaculate work it's like I hate you so much but amazing work <laughs> <laughs> yeah like as an artist you don't want to be complaining because it's like you used to you create a piece of artwork and then you can get recognized for that piece of art now that doesn't really happen as much. Now it's almost like as an artist, you have to adapt to this mm-hmm. new uh, ultimate, like infinite scrolling of piles of art. It's almost like you've got to adapt to become a brand. Mm-hmm. So it's no longer about one artwork. It's about you being a brand and pump, like being consistent and getting your following base in each month or each week or whatever you want. Just constantly prove that you can create the next, like some inspiration. So it's like, yeah, as an artist, it's kind of you've adapted yourself to brand yourself. Basically. What are your thoughts on that? Just to touch on that for a second, because it kind of goes back to what you're saying about before, you know, you get hired as a model or now, because it is like brand actually becomes part of the title in a lot of ways. Like the way that people will remember you, the way you differentiate from everyone else, you will be that, um, let's just say fantasy creature modeler who specializes in women pixies. Like it's it's literally goes that granular to, to make you memorable because there is so much out there. I'm kind of curious for you, like, what are your thoughts on that in terms of do you find that can be limiting at all? And you know, when people have this expectation, especially online, of the type of work you're doing uh, versus perhaps like you want to do something dark and gritty or, or different from what the people expect of you. I kind of niched myself into digital humans, photorealistic, and it's like I want to go back to Veggie Tales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I've been kind of experimenting with some different styles lately, and so they've not been. Some of them have been pretty successful, but some of them have been like people are like. What is this? We, I don't like this. I did one of a uh, portrait of Marie who's got four heads all mm-hmm. stuck together. And it was just about like seeing how like, I, it was like exploration of identity of how do we define identity when online you can just copy and paste so much mm-hmm. stuff. So I wanted to see how you, if you copy and paste the digital, photorealistic digital human, <laughs> how you react to it. It didn't go across too well. People weren't like, blown away by it. But for me, it was like one of the most exciting pieces I've done because it photorealistic is rather boring, I find. Mm-hmm. It's discovering identity, looking at a deeper meaning of what makes people people. That's the stuff I really want to look into. And so this piece really was a eye opener for me to go down that rabbit hole. But yeah, once I, oh, but my, my audience base is like, no, no, we just want photorealistic. So I got to somehow break the barrier and kind of like lead people to into what I want. I think a really fascinating conversation of are you going to be held hostage? Like, is your creativity going to be held hostage to what everyone else wants versus you being the artist, like wanting to create? And and of course, you're going to evolve. Like mm-hmm. you, you saying photorealism, it's like once you crack that code and you've done it a hundred times, eventually you're going to say, well, what else is there? But there's that expectation of you that no, you, you just you're compartmentalized. You do that. You would only do that, or I won't click like on your your work. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's important as an artist that you never like do what you're told. I think you should always follow like a new creative. Like you, as an artist, you're thinking of new possible ways of seeing things, and like you're trying to be creative. You're trying to open the world to new things. So I'm kind of breaking away from that photorealistic stuff. I don't really. I'm not too interested in it because honestly, like it's digital humans, give five or 10 years down the road, most people will probably be able to do what I do with the newer tools. As tools get better, it'll be easier to create fully realistic. So 
Yeah. If I want to be remembered in any way or be a successful artist, I can't just create stuff, which is everybody's going to do in 10 years. I got to be creative and think of, be the guys who are opening those doors for other people. Yeah, you got to innovate. Um, do you remember Poser back in the day? Oh, yeah. I yeah. think it's still around, uh, oddly enough, but like, I think it was Bryce, which was like the terrain kind of program that did, you know, so suddenly the internet would just be full of really badly rendered terrain that people could paint with fractals as depth maps. And then mm -hmm. Poser was the other thing that would just kind of litter through uh, a lot of 3D galleries. But in a lot of ways, it's kind of like, okay, you can't model or, you know, rig a character, but suddenly you don't need to. So it's, you know, if uh, suddenly you, you will get all these characters that aren't necessarily great, but like, you know, everyone can, uh, now jump on that. So innovation is, is important because yeah, otherwise um, eventually everything does get easier and uh, like the threshold, I guess, to, to get in is, is a lot lower. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I always, I always wanted to somehow be like cutting edge. <laughs> so I gotta make myself important somehow. So I, I have to adapt and grow myself. And it's just yeah. good as a human being, like always grow and try to exactly. do uncomfortable things. For you, both creatively but also technically where or how do you get inspiration and, and look for ways to grow or challenge yourself so for, for a lot of my career for my portraits i've looked at the old masters like rembrandt caravaggio's because it's like from my standpoint i think the masters they were the pinnacle of art like they just they just did the best possible aesthetics mm -hmm. and so i feel like they reached a peak which i feel like we might have lost a little bit so I've always gone back to them to, for reference inspiration to see if I could kind of capture what they did into digital format. Because they, they care, like their paintings, you can look at them today and they still feel alive. Their paintings, mm -hmm. these, these are now dead people and they've not lived for hundreds of years, but you can connect humanly, emotionally with these paintings. And so that aspect, I wanted to take that and put that into my digital portraits. So I've been inspired a lot by that uh, by those masters, but now I'm trying to figure out how to, instead of being like copying that style, but just trying to figure out who I am and have my own voice rather than mimicking uh, the masters. I feel like I've spent the last seven years doing that and now I'm really trying to push myself to do something different, do something new and something more. Mm -hmm. So for me, if to find inspiration, it's like really it's just trying to, I'm trying to outdo myself, like try to get better each time. Cool. I like that. And I guess also kind of on the topic of that would be like, what are your thoughts on NFTs? Because I've had Beeple and Boss Logic and a lot of other really great artists on. And that's, you know, it's such an interesting debate that I avoid like the plague whenever the subject of NFTs come up just because it's always going to be the same damn argument. Um, but for me, what you're saying about like the art still being alive, like I think that's one thing when I think of looking at a piece of art in a gallery is, is not like just the fact that it looks like an amazing piece of art, but it's actually something that physically was painted. There was a person who, you know, put brush to the canvas and, and created something that um, historically now is still there, but there was someone who actually put that there versus, you know, NFTs being a, a whole different thing. But like art, I think it's more the physical connection to the fact that someone was there putting that together and, and their vision of it. So yeah, what are your thoughts around on that topic? Yeah, I think uh, NFTs are, Definitely get the future. I think it'll be just be a matter of time before almost everything becomes NFT. So, but yeah, I'm definitely like on board with it. I I do feel like uh, maybe right now it's not working the best way possible because I find the stuff I see which does sell is not the best quality stuff. And yeah. So the, this non like like lower quality, they're becoming like the the artist of our generation. Maybe as like maybe I've got it wrong, but I feel like. Maybe there should be some level of talent and some sort of. This is where it goes down the rabbit hole of like art being subjective and you don't understand yeah. what art is or, you know, all the arguments that come up. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and people like people buy the work which will sell as well. Mm -hmm. So people will buy something based on the fact on its sellable value. So they'll buy that artwork and therefore, because it's going to make money, it therefore becomes good artwork. Mm -hmm. Where money shouldn't be a reflection of good artwork. That's right. The, the price validates the, you know, the, the amazingness of the, the artwork. Yeah, yeah. Like a good artwork I'll say is how well art uh, serves its function of mm -hmm. creation. Jackson Pollock's work, I always explain this is what good artwork is. 
Jackson's Pollock work, most people can say they don't like it, but it's just like his drip paintings. There, it seems like anybody can do it. But the purpose of that was during the Cold War with Russia, he created those paintings and they were supposed to represent freedom and like there was no control and that contradicted Russia's uh, communist their like belief system. And so back in the day, it was like they were painted to show what democracy was. And so those paintings were a perfect representation of that. And so because it served its purpose so well, it was kind of good art because that's exactly what it did. It like it moved a gen like a whole nation to believe this. Yeah. And so when I try to explain what good art and bad art is, Jackson Pollock's work moved a nation to believe something. So that's like that's amazing artwork, mm -hmm. really. And you, but if you take it out of context, like maybe you look at it today and not have that background, you probably just be like, yeah, like my five year old kid could do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean th that's a really great point, and it kind of goes onto the whole subject around art. That photography is a good example, actually where it's like, oh, that's a photo, you know, there's a dozen around, they're not worth much. The, the reason that a lot of value gets given to, let's say a photograph or a piece of art is usually the story behind it, because usually the person buying it, it's not so much that they want to hang a, a cool landscape photo in their living room. It's, it's also because it's a conversation piece. People walk in and mention cool photo. It's like, oh, let me tell you about the photographer and this and how the photo, you know, the eye, the, the way that it came together. Um, a lot of times it's, it's really is the backstory that kind of um, creates the value or the interest around the piece. And so I'm kind of curious for you, and especially because what you were just saying about Pollock, like same thing, the, the fact that you can say all this, it means that the, the story is there, the history is there as well. With your work, like whenever you're doing, let's go back to portraits, is there a lot of story or thought going into it other than obviously creating these amazing pieces, but also, you know, who they are and and yeah. the thought that goes into it. Yeah, absolutely. It's kind of hard to see, but if you're like, you're looking at them individually, like I'm trying to express that person's identity. And there's like multiple ways you can do it through like clothing, through body language, through lighting. Like there's so many techniques to express somebody's identity. And I'm trying to be honest with about who they are. Mm. And so I get a good representation of, of them. But if you look at them as a collective, you can kind of start seeing that they're actually there's actually portraits of me. Like, cause it's like, you, this is how I see each person. You see who's important to my life. You see who my friends are. You see who my family is. And you see how I see them. So as a collective, it's just like a representation of me. So it's I like, it's like, actually a lot of layers in them. I like that. I like that a lot. Um, I, I'm, I'm just getting deja vu, but I'm remembering there was like a tiny thumbnail. It was probably on LinkedIn or somewhere, but like literally a tiny thumbnail. Maybe it was Chris Nichols or something. I don't know, but um, it was something that was so tiny, but the fact that I just instantly recognized that person, even though it's, you know, uh, microscopic and it's CG, but it's just like, oh, that's so-and-so. It's just, to, to me in a lot of ways, like that's like a huge validation just because it's like, you're, you're still connecting with that person as if you saw a tiny uh, photo of someone that you, you recognize, but it's, obviously, um, you know, a CG representation as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think when it comes to portraits, it's like there's a lot of levels in it, which is kind of, it's quite interesting to start this discovering. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like just like, for example, like uh, like Chris Nichols' portrait, like his pose, his pose is a way of how it represents who he is. Like I have mm -hmm. him like, he's a, he also does podcasts. So yeah, I have we, we, we tag team each other quite a, a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll jump on his and vice versa. Yeah, so I have him like, like almost sat, like sat at a table, his hands on his on his like temple. It's, I wanted to give him the same vibe as uh, Steve Jobs with his mm -hmm. uh, photo of his uh, hand on his chin. It gave us this like really like thoughtful, insightful. But uh, Chris Nichols' portrait, you can tell he's not waiting to talk. He's not like, hey, I want to say my opinion. In the portrait, you can tell that he's actually listening to you. So mm -hmm. as you look at the portrait, I wanted the viewer to feel like, oh, he's there to listen to what you have to say. And so everything I did in the piece is make you feel like you, you've got a voice. Again, that's the story that goes behind the art. So I love that. I think it's so cool. I'm kind of curious, like going back to, let's say, not necessarily your first portrait, but one of your first CG characters, let's say, um, what was your process back then versus what your creative process typically is now? Uh, it's relatively similar usually when i create my portraits i'll do like a little photo shoot so like when i first did my self portraits uh this is back uh 2014 
Mm -hmm. I did a photo shoot of myself. It's kind of like almost like taking a scan. I do the whole 360 around. Uh, I just try to get flat lighting, like no shadows, so I can use those photos for help uh, with texturing. And then I just did a whole bunch of different poses. And then just to give an idea of what I kind of style I wanted to go for. And then uh, once I had all that photo references, I found an inspiration like Rem a Rembrandt painting I liked, and I wanted to recreate the Rembrandt painting. So I kind of uh, chose some, went through all my photography set and just chose the lighting which kind of matched it. And I kind of collaged this idea of what I wanted for portraits. And then I sort of started executing it. So that's kind of like my process. Uh, obviously, Maya Mudbucks for modeling and texturing, Photoshop for some color corrections, uh, B Ray for rendering. Now we fast forward to like what I do now. It's relatively the same, but instead of, I used to take like 100 photos, now I take maybe 1,000 photos, 1,000 plus photos of each subject. I'll spend like four, four to five hours just taking photos of one person just to get every single detail. Like, I got a much uh, better camera now. I, I bought uh, lights, like uh, actual like like stage lights. Uh, I got like a light light wand, which I use for different type of lighting styles. Uh, the programs have got a bit better. V-Ray's renderer is a bit better. GPU rendering. I can do more iterations, do them quicker. So it's almost like when I work, I'll do a render and then I'll fix the render and then I'll do another render and fix it. So it's, in a way I try and it's about fixing rather than building. Mm -hmm. So now with more iterations, I can do more fixes. So I can do like a thousand portraits per portrait rather than just like a hundred portraits per portrait. I'm curious with the photos, like are you doing that for photogrammetry or is it more just reference as well as for textures? Uh, just reference and mm -hmm. texturing, yeah. I try not to use scanning too much because it's, I've, I've tried it in the past, but it, it ends up like I just end up having to do so much cleanup. It's actually mm -hmm. just faster for me just to sculpt it. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Obviously you do a lot of commercial work too. Like what are some of the projects you worked on? Like uh, Mandalorian, things like that. Like what are some of the more memorable projects that you've worked on that kind of stand out for either being fun or just really cool, interesting character projects or whatever they might be? Uh, I think career wise, I'll probably say, uh, I think Oats, Oats Studio with Neil Blomkamp was probably one of my more favorite. Uh, I'm really good friends with Chris Harvey over there. So oh, yeah, yeah, we, we go way, way back, like 25 years ago or something, I forget. So uh, yes, so yeah, you probably know all about Oats then. But that was such a cool experience. Uh, basically, Neil was like, he would come to you and be like, I have this rough idea of what I want. And he briefly gave you a, the shortest description and then you just go with it and you have to build something crazy. I had to build him uh, the zygote. So he gave me some rough concept drawings and it's like, this is a roughly kind of what I want, but just feel free to do whatever you want, do anything you want. And then I just spent like a couple of months just building this zygote of like, it was like 90 bodies all stuck together. I always wondered who modeled that because it's just such a cool, uh, interesting character. So uh, yeah. that, that's cool. It's actually funny because uh, Neil was meant to come on the podcast and uh, I never followed up so which is my stupid mistake uh, but it, was, it was actually during the time where he's trying to pitch um, I think he's doing a crowdfunding for uh, for all of his short films um, so I still remember he was doing a, a live stream and Chris was on there as well and I was texting Chris back and forth about getting Neil on the podcast so watching a live stream you see Chris in the background texting and <laughs> <laughs> but that's cool I mean again I think there's a few kind of outliers like directors who are just want to do really cool amazing fun projects and, and he's definitely one who not only that but embraces technology and visual effects and wants to do yeah it's cool fun stuff with cool fun people yeah i think yeah neil would be a good one to the podcast i mean he's one of those guys who's like he'll turn down money for his own uh creative freedom mm -hmm. like so many times we were at oats and like people would come to him like hey can you do this but we're gonna tell you how to do it and he's like oh you're gonna tell me how to do it then no <laughs> you give me the project, I'll do it my way. If you don't like it, I'm out. I really I wanted an alien to happen. Would have been amazing. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. I got a lot of friends who are feature film directors and there's a few who kind of went that route. And then interestingly, because I, I do think it's one of those things that for a lot of directors, depending on the direction you're going, you know, feature films are kind of like the, the top tier. It's kind of where you want to end up. But there's at least a, a handful of my friends who have 
gotten into that situation and then realize how little creative control they actually have and just completely be like, yeah, this isn't for me and I'm gonna go back to short films and, and doing my own pieces because that way I get final cut, I get final say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Neil told me a few stories where they're just like trying to control him, tell him how to run his show, which actors to pick and stuff. And he's just like, no, guys, yeah, like, <laughs> I, I, this is the way I want to, like, but, but I really respect him for standing up for his own beliefs. Like, yeah. he really turned down a lot of cool projects to just to have that freedom and not be told what to do. Uh, he came and did a, um, a Q&A session at ILM one time, uh, which is really cool because I, I guess I never really thought about it till someone said, do you play a lot of video games? <laughs> and everyone laughed and I'm like, oh yeah, I, I didn't think about that until just then. But yeah, like, duh, like <laughs> obviously the stuff that he does, it's it's quite sci-fi and uh, very video game inspired. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Curious, like for you, the same thing, like obviously creatively and commercially, like what do you think are some of the pros and cons of each? Like obviously, uh, commercially, you with, with the work you're doing, you get paid for it. You get to work on big projects, but um, you know, do you find one preference over the other in terms of like the stuff that you like working on uh, in your personal time versus things that you're working on typically for a film or a TV show? It took me a while to learn, but I had to draw a strong line dividing the two. Like I don't mix them at all anymore. I used to go to work and create stuff I loved and be like, oh man, this is amazing. I can't wait to show this and show. But I, I didn't own it, and so the companies were like, "No, no, you're not allowed to show this. This is like NDA." Like, and so it was like I was I, I emotionally attached myself to a lot of projects, which I, I got paid for. It's like a business transaction. I don't own it. They can do whatever they want. They can take it and throw it in the garbage. And I had to use. I had to become okay with that, which was very difficult. But that's what personal work is for. for. Like. You do personal work not to be told what to do. You just do whatever you feel like. That's your creative output, not the industry. So I've yeah. learned to draw that line between the two. And so when it comes to personal work, I just do whatever I want. I, I would sometimes re reject a lot of freelance uh, jobs just because I'm like, I just rather not get paid and just be free and do what I want to do. But so far it's been pretty good for me because I, but it's a very important that I get my creative outlets and I don't usually get that from work anymore. So I always have to do it then in personal work. And and that's uh, kind of loops back to what we were saying earlier that, you know, suddenly going online where it's like, I get my creative outlet, I can do whatever I want. Then it's like, no, the gods of social media are spoken. I, I can't do, you know, uh, four-headed people. <laughs> I, I, it's an interesting thing just to kind of see like, um, you know, because I think deep down it comes down to who are you doing the art for? You know? Yeah, yeah. And exactly. uh, yeah. But, uh, it's easy to get persuaded to do your personal work for other people. Like people are like, oh, we love this. I want to see more of this. And so you feel like you should do that. And it's mm -hmm. like, you really have to listen to that inner voice and be like, no, I'm just going to do whatever I feel like, whether you like it or not. I mean, back before social media, I'd draw in my sketchbook, finish a drawing, close the book, put the book away. Nobody would ever see it. Mm -hmm. And I felt great. <laughs> I never did it for anybody else. It's pretty amazing. Uh, again, like I could go on and on about it, but yeah, it's, I, I think it is a really fascinating subject around like, who are you truly doing the art for? And it's, it's also one of those things that you'll usually hear the people who are going to do air quotes have made it that are going to say, you do it for yourself. And it's like the people listening are like, well, it's easy for you to say, cause I haven't got there yet, but <laughs> it is one of those things that like, are you doing it? You know, is your creative style dictated by what's trending versus, you know, what creative outlet, like what's inside of you. So um, yeah, I, I, I find the subject really fascinating. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious too, like uh, you moving over to work with Unity, like um, what was that whole experience like for you um, and in terms of like also what you're involved in now? Yeah, yeah, it's been pretty good. You know, working in the visual effects industry is pretty awesome, but yeah, transitioning to Unity being real time, it's just, it's kind of nice just to see this like change of pace. I'm working in the labs departments, so I'm kind of like, I'm allowed to make mistakes <laughs> like I'm almost encouraged to make those mistakes to, because we have to figure out how things are going to be done. Whereas visual effects, it's like, no, no, you just, you got to do whatever you can, hack it together to make sure it works. Whereas <laughs> Unity, I'm like, well, I did this for a month. That didn't really work. So I'm just going to try it this way now. And then it's almost like I'm being promoted to do that stuff. So I really love the, uh, the freedom of that. And so, yeah, most, mostly focusing right now on just digital humans. Cool. And just seeing how, uh, you know, just trying to create believable digital humans, uh, looking at hair solutions, uh, skin solutions, uh, 
basically just all around character stuff. Forgive me for not knowing the title of it. I did see an amazing um, YouTube video the other day from Unity of uh, a more mature woman uh, with long oh, hair. The enemies demo? Uh, yeah, I, I didn't have any part of that, but I wish I did. It was so cool. I was just curious about that because, yeah, it just popped in my mind now, but um, I, I thought it was a smart decision to have someone who's slightly aged over, so, you know, the typical, like, young, flawless, beautiful woman because I feel like um, if you go back to a good example would be Beowulf back in, like, 2006, oh, you know, yeah. where Anthony Hopkins looks amazing and flawless, but then Angelina Jolie, because she's so flawless, looks completely fake uh, because of those imperfections. Like, for you, is that something that you find too? Is just, like, creative style like realism comes with the imperfections or or what are some of the kind of secret sauce that you look for uh yeah i think we got like the uncanny valley is something which is we've not got over it yet i mean we as a first still i can create something which is photorealistic and you believe it to be a photo like still wise but motion and movement it's still one of those things where it's, it's going to look uncanny valley still mm -hmm. and so i think it'll just take a little bit more research and time to get over that yeah. But yeah, I think, I think we're on our way though, for sure. What limitations, if any, are you finding with, let's say, your typical process for doing things when, let's say, you're doing in V-Ray versus um, something that's going to a real-time engine? Like real-time is just like, you don't get the, like, let's say you talk about lighting, for example, you don't get the quite the, like the number of like uh, rays, I guess, whatever you call them, but it's like mm -hmm. the quality isn't as good as like a static render just yet. I'm sure like in time, the, the like yeah, dial all samples to 100 you know <laughs> yeah so right now i'm just discovering like a, a lack of quality in real time so that's kind of one of my jobs is trying to help push that and make things more believable but yeah i think static renders like v-ray where you just render an image even if it takes like 10 minutes or something it still looks better yeah that's cool and going to your personal work i mean obviously you know i'm sure you get a lot of attention online i, I guess like when did it happen and uh what was the piece that i guess was the one that everyone's like holy crap like have you seen this and kind of seeing things really blow up i'd say my my, my very first self-portrait i think that's when uh yeah i think that's when people started to recognize my work a little bit yeah i think that when i released that it, it wasn't even go viral but it had like a few thousand likes and back in the day the, a few few thousand was like insane yeah so i think that was a big one and it's gonna I just kind of went with the flow and then as each time I did a new portrait, I just got more and more likes. Uh, I do think artistically I've gone through stages. So I think when I did my first self-portrait that opened me up to portraiture and realistic digital humans. And then I think it was probably my second self-portrait where I think I took the next step. Mm -hmm. And after that, I felt like I figured out more techniques to create more believable like uh, likeness and like more photorealistic styles. And so I feel like I'd made another jump at that point. And so that my second self-portrait went was pretty successful too. That's cool. Um, and is there any specific favorite pieces that kind of stand out to you for, again, story or, or for whatever reason? Uh, it depends on what mood I'm in. I think uh, one of my favorites ones is my latest self-portrait because that for me has really defined a new style like a new I, that's where i was kind of breaking away from the old master style and trying to figure out who i am and what i want to what my voice is so yeah. mentally that put me through another state and another level but as for portraits i like i've got a few favorites jasper is one of my favorites just because i, I love him he's on my I'm on there right now looking <laughs> but which one's jasper okay and i see I, it. yeah he's yeah he's a, my seven seven year old nephew i just like them because i like they think he's an awesome kid yeah but artistically, I think uh, Marie and my latest one, Prometheus, have been the most uh, enjoyable, fun ones to create. The ones which are a little bit more weird. Yeah, no, I love it. I, I saw that the other day, actually. And I, I guess like talking about that one for a second, like what was the inspiration behind that? Like doing all the musculature and um, going for a bit more of a different approach? I've been focusing so much on trying to capture people's likeness and identities. I've been focusing solely on the skin. But really, it's like identity goes to the bone, basically. And I, I've worked so much with the anatomy. I'm like, well, like, why am I always only staying on the surface? I just wanted to go extra levels deep and try and capture someone's personality and likeness 
to the, like it's placing the muscles as well. And then I was like, well, I can't just do just muscles. And it's like, I, so I just figured out, try to figure out a way how to blend muscles with skin. So I came up with this like flame transparency. <laughs> so you can like, as the flame comes up, you can see the muscles underneath. And then, yeah, it's just, I don't know, like creating, seeing identity through different ways. In terms of, I guess, like upcoming technology, like I'm curious whether you keep an eye out for different unique things that are around the corner, if there's anything that kind of caught your eye, even if it is, whether it's new rendering techniques or whether it's uh, ways to capture data or I don't know what. I mean, the stuff I kind of look at, I, I my, my eyes are mostly on art. Like, like, I try to follow what people are doing artistically and creatively and seeing how they're breaking down their own barriers. And I try to see, not copy what they're doing, but see how if they're breaking their barrier by doing this method, I can try and break my own barriers. So I look at what artists are doing creatively. And so I'm inspired by that stuff. Uh, for technology wise, I just try to focus on just making sure I get the latest like GPU renders from V-Ray. I, I almost like rely on other people for technology stuff. <laughs> like like with V-Ray, I'm like, I'll let them figure that out. Once they figured it out, I'll just I'll take it and then use my creativity to see what I can do with it. I like it. I guess like one or two last things I would say, like for, I guess any advice for people starting out, like let's say if there are some character artists that um, they're, they're just wanting to kind of get started and at the same time, like try to find their niche and um, and also, yeah, kind of stand out when it comes to everybody else out there. I think being original is probably the most important thing. Like if I was to hire somebody, if, if I see somebody who's copying somebody else, I, I mean, I may as well just go to the source and it, <laughs> hire that guy, you know what I mean? So I, I like originality and I like people who are trying to push the limits because when you see those people it's like you know they're going to push the limits they're going to do the same in the company yeah and they're also doing it not because they're trying to just get the job but they're doing it because they're passionate about it when i see people just copying other people you know they're probably just doing it just to get the job because mm -hmm. they're like oh this company will like it so i'm gonna model this or create this because this company does it so the original i like that uh, no, this has been really awesome. And uh, honestly, the time's kind of flown by <laughs> oddly yeah. really quick. Um, okay. Where can people go to find out more about you and see all your amazing work? Uh, you can just like Google Ian Spriggs. I mean, I got my website, I'm Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, just Google my name and there I am. There you go. Uh, I'll make sure to link to everything in the show notes. But again, this has been really awesome to catch up and get to see a bit more about how, how you work and, and also what inspires you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.